Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Todd Demon. It's my pleasure and honor to be principal here at Morrison R. Wade High School. So welcome guests. Welcome those of you on live streaming. On behalf of myself, to the public schools, and our very own Dr. Durant, we are pleased to host this event this evening. It's my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Robin Hage. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, my name is Robin Hage, and I'm somewhat of the coordinator of these events. If you were able to join us in January at Scott High School and you're here tonight, we welcome you back. If this is your first time attending, we welcome you as well. And we want to make sure that you are aware that there will be a third lecture this spring in May, and we'll provide more information at the end of this um, event tonight for you. Really, the premise behind all of this is to kick off the 175th anniversary of Toledo Public Schools that will occur in 2024. And part of that is to bring together the community into our facilities to see the architecture, to see these buildings that have stood for over 100 years now, and to get the local networking of historians and the people who have a passion for recording history. And you will be so pleased with tonight's lecture. Joe Boyle has a passion that is very hard to match, probably more so than mine. And I, I, I'm pretty passionate about history. Um, but that's really the reason why we're gathering so that we can get our community into our facilities as we approach our anniversary. Over here on the table, as you came in, there are some books and DVDs for sale. One of the things that we are working on is ensuring that there is an Ohio historical marker for Scott, Waite, and then Harvard Elementary School in that order. So the Scott Ohio Historical Marker application has already been submitted and mailed. We are just a little bit shy of covering the cost for that, however. So the books and the DVDs are $10, and that goes towards that fund. If you would like to make a contribution, but you are not able to this evening because you didn't bring cash, a lot of people don't carry cash anymore, um, there are these little business cards that are uh, over at the table that have a QR code where you can make a digital donation, and that goes directly to the TPS Foundation. They are graciously partnering with Toledo Public Schools to hold the funds for this project. And then on the reverse is a reminder of our May lecture, which I will talk about. Um, I do want to mention one other thing that's over here on the table before Joe comes up. The uniforms and the scrapbooks uh, belong to a dear friend of mine. His name was Bill Keller. Bill was 19 years old. He was a Toledoan, and he was called up. He was drafted, and he was one of the first gentlemen to enter Dachau concentration camp. Um, I had the honor of seeing some of his uh, memorabilia, I don't know if that's the right word, that he brought back from that concentration camp. It was very difficult to look at. But if you look through his scrapbook, he is a 17, 18-year-old young man who knows he's going to be drafted. And he cuts out these newspaper articles knowing that his time is coming. And the scrapbooks stop the day that he gets drafted. So if you have the chance at the end of the lecture tonight to check that out, I think that would be wonderful to um, remember Bill tonight as well. So it is my distinct honor to introduce Joe Boyle, a dear friend, a local historian. He has been a teacher in Toledo Public Schools for two decades now. He was named Ohio History Teacher of the Year. He has a brand new book coming out on World War II uh, in Toledo, and that will be out this summer. I believe there's a sign-up sheet over there. Is that correct? If you would like to get your name on the list, he can email you when the book is available. And also at the end of his presentation, he'll tell you how you can obtain his book. Joe is an outstanding educator, historian, and person. And when I asked his daughter, I said, what should I say about your dad? She says, Tell him he's a good dad, too. So it is my honor to introduce Joe Boyle. Robin and Ellie, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I am incredibly glad to be here tonight. Um, this entire project is one more great reason to be TPS proud. And thanks to Robin, Dr. Durant, uh, and our board and cabinet. I would love to direct your attention to one other item in the room tonight. If you look back there, there's a red flag hanging in the corner. 
And it's one of my favorite artifacts in this building that is full of great artifacts. Uh, spring of 1942, after the first 50 weight men get drafted, uh, the school put together uh, a service flag with blue stars for every kid from here who had been who had been joined who had joined the service, and pretty quickly those flag, those stars started changing from blue to gold for the dead, and that is the original flag. I don't think there's anything quite like it in Toledo, and I just I just love that piece, and I love having it here with us uh, tonight. So I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about the project that brought me to this room tonight. Uh, I've taught a World War II class in TPS for about 10 years. And at the center of that class is something we call the Fallen Hero Project, where each one of the students is assigned the names of one of the 1,100 men from Toledo who were killed in the Second World War. They research this man's life, death, service, and I realized after a couple of years that if we had 50 kids up here telling stories, they were telling the whole story of the war through 50 people. About the same time, I realized I hated my textbook. And to paraphrase my good friend Vince Guerreri, who has said a million times, if the book you want isn't out there, you're kind of duty bound to write it. So building on some interviews that I'd already recorded before and some research I did after, I started working on a book telling the story of World War II through the people of Toledo in 2016. And in 2020, I signed a contract with the University of Toledo Press uh, to publish Toledo's War, how Toledoans shaped the course of the Second World War and how it shaped Toledo. Uh, that book will be out this summer uh, because my wife is a genius, we have a QR code. And if you want, you can take a picture of this and it'll take you a little Google form and we'll put you on the email list for when the book comes out. Um, tonight, what I hope to give you is a sneak peek at a few of the people from that story. Now, I need to apologize for two things before I start. Number one is that I'm basically reading from a script tonight. I had brain radiation all of last week, and it is a miracle I know my name right now. So without a script, I was feeling a little helpless. Um, second, I wish I had three hours for this, um, because I grew really close with a lot of the people that I interviewed over the course of this. And I wish I was sharing all of their stories tonight. Um, but that's why there's a 250,000 word book coming out this summer. And I can't wait for you to meet all of them at that point. So uh, despite the fact that just being in this room tonight means we love Toledo a little bit, I hate to say it, but there's really nothing special about us. Um, in terms of the war, Toledo is about as average a place as you could pick. But I think that's what makes us special. So many of the big themes of the Second World War and America's involvement in it come together in a place specifically like Toledo. We were shaped by our people, Eastern European and Middle Eastern immigrants, a thriving Jewish community, a nascent and vibrant black community in the 1930s and 40s, and a Rust Belt industrial complex that was at the height of its powers. This was a city that dreamed big in 1940. Now, again, not unique. I could be describing Detroit or Cleveland, or Pittsburgh, um, really the whole of America with that. But this is our story. And what I hope tonight is that every one of you out there can find yourself in one of these stories. Because even though Toledo's story is not exceptional, it is absolutely essential to who we are today. So these stories are about people who are a lot like you and me. And for the most part, these are not the stories you're gonna hear tonight of super patriots who were trying to kill or die for their country. And if that's what you're here for, I'm sorry in advance. This is the story of regular people making really complicated decisions at a really complicated time and doing the best that they could. And the heroism that you're gonna to find tonight, I hope, is not going to be in the stories of battlefield exploits, but in the way people persevered through almost uniformly awful challenges at home and abroad in the most human of ways. So the first person I'd like to introduce you tonight to uh, is the chucker. So I'd like to take you back 81 years to a sunny, cold winter afternoon when Toledo's entry in the NBA's forerunner league played its first home game. Yes, we were a professional basketball town. They played their first home game as a 3 p.m. Sunday tilt of the Jim White Chevys, the Toledo Jim White Chevys, against the Indianapolis Kotskis at the Toledo Civic Auditorium, which those of my generation know better as the Erie Street Market. By far, the most famous player on that lousy, slippery terrazzo floor was Toledo forward Chuck Chukovitz, known invariably as the Chucker. 
Chukovic scored more points in the first half of that game than either player from either team would score in the rest of the game. Suddenly, in the middle of the first half, the public address announcer interrupted the game with a major announcement. It was December 7th of 1941. Quote, they came on the loudspeaker and announced Pearl Harbor had been attacked, remembered Chukovic's daughter, Kay, retelling her mother's stories of that afternoon. She said a sailor got out and waved at everybody and ran out like he had to get going. Everybody was in shock. Within a year, Chuck Chukovic left his night job, NBA MVP of the 41-42 season, and his day job, phys ed teacher here at Morrison R. Waite High School, to join the Army. People were doing what they were doing. It was a Sunday. People were off work. Stores were closed. The next day, recruiting stations in the city were swamped. The principal at DeVilbus High School noted an alarming number of absences after first hour, and just before lunch called a meeting in the auditorium of all the school's boys. He told them, stay in school, wait here, we'll figure out what the War Department wants to do with you. And thus began World War II, at least for Americans. But for Toledoans, a city of Polish, Hungarian, Romanian, Czech, Slovak, Chinese, and Japanese immigrants, and a vibrant Jewish community hailing from all European nations, the war had been foremost in hearts and minds for years. The stories of those people, in many cases, start right here in our schools. George Lambroff grew up all over East Toledo. He bounced between homes and between schools during the Depression. And though his father didn't live with him, George found father figures in two men here at White High School. Uh, football coaches Jack Mollenkoff and Frank Pauley. The coaches taught this rough kid life lessons. Coach Mollenkoff said Lambroff was the meanest kid he ever had on the line, and Lambroff ate it up. He still bragged about it 70 years later. Quote, I always love football, and the rougher, the better, Lambroff recalled in 2016. I gave it, and I took it. Sometimes he gave it too much. And in a 1942 game against Sandusky, a player got around Lambroff to put some pressure on the weight quarterback. Lambroff decided to get even, following as a block quote from Mr. Lambroff. I did him dirty, I put him down, and I was on top of the guy. And when I got up, in those days we had those tapered spikes, and his arm was out like that. I stepped on him, deliberately, proud of myself, big old smile on my face. I look up about 15 yards, and there's Jack on the sideline. He always wore a hat, I said, George? And I knew I was in trouble. I come over there and he says, you know what you just did, don't you? And I said, yes sir, yes sir. He says, go on over, sit on that bench. You're out the rest of the game. Just like that. Before the game was over, Jack comes over, said, hey, you got one more thing you're going to do. You're going to go over there and apologize. He says, I'm going to make sure you do, because I'm going to go with you. And their coach says, oh, Jack, it's all right. I said, no, it's not all right. I learned. I learned. Football. You play hard, but you don't play dirty. And I did. 20 years later, half a world away, Lambroff would remember that lesson with stark clarity. One of Lambroff's teammates was a Point Placer named Bill Provencia. Bill Provencia's address in Point Place during the Depression was yes. For a while, his family lived up around 300. For a while, down in the hundreds, for a spell just across from Cullen Park boat launch. Why so many addresses? He recalled years later that his mom said it was cheaper to move than it was to pay rent. The Depression was obviously difficult for most Americans, and it was doubly difficult for African Americans. Jake Chandler was a student at Scott High School in the mid-30s, a standout track athlete who took Scott to states. Chandler went on to the University of Toledo to become a teacher. You could say I fell in love with him the minute I started reading about him. Chandler graduates from UT to become a teacher, comes back to apply to Toledo Public, and that's where we're gonna take a second to talk about Nidra Thomas. Um, Nidra Thomas was named after the doctor who delivered him in Georgia on a sharecropping farm in 1912. His father was targeted by the KKK in 1917. They escaped with minutes to go, heading north, finally arriving in Toledo. Family, wife, 11 children. They were a pioneering black family in what was known at that time as Lanks Hill and soon became known as Pinewood District. Nidra Thomas applied to the old Woodward Technical High School downtown and on his registration form, created a new first name and a new identity for himself. 
William Thomas, Bill Thomas. And Bill Thomas transferred and graduated from Libby High School in 1930 in the depths of depression. After working as a meat cutter at Indiana and Division, Thomas entered the University of Toledo, earned a bachelor's degree, and like Jake Chandler, came back home to TPS to apply for a job. And like Chandler, Thomas was told, we have enough black teachers. That number was seven. Rejected by TPS, Chandler applied to the Toledo Police Department and was hired. The only black man in his class and one of less than a half dozen on the force. Mr. Thomas took his rejection and went in a different way. He went to the Ohio State University where he earned a master's degree. After finding it difficult to get work with a master's degree, he went to Northwestern and was fully funded as a PhD candidate. Both men found success, but only after encountering prejudice at the hands of the place that raised them. One other Toledo serviceman who'd seen even more prejudice than Chandler and Thomas was Stephen Mossbacher, the young man in this picture. Uh, born in Nuremberg, Germany, Mossbacher's father was among the most respected OBGYNs in the German city that was at the heart of the Nazi movement. When the Nazis took over, Dr. Mossbacher's family was nominally safe. So well-renowned was Dr. Mossbacher that top Nazi officials in the town sent their wives to the Jewish doctor. And in a spirit that I think gets darker the more you think about it, they'd warn Dr. Mossbacher if a weekend might be particularly dangerous for his family to be in the city. But as the pace of violence increased throughout 37 and 38, the Mossbachers realized their situation was untenable. And in early fall of 1938, literally weeks before Kristallnacht, they escaped Nazi Germany, boarded this ship for America, and sailed for New York. I really encourage you all to look at the smiles in this picture. I hope none of us ever know every emotion that is wrapped up in those smiles of survival and salvation. After a few years in New York, Dr. Mossbacher established a practice in West Toledo, uh, sponsored incidentally by the Kobacher family of, of Tidkeys. Um, one former Toledoan vocally spoke up for refugee families like the Mossbachers, uh, and that was Joey Brown. Now, Joey, as many of you know, uh, was born in Holgate over in Henry County, uh, but he was raised just off the airline junction in South Toledo. He traveled with a circus in vaudeville as a boy, and in the 1919s, I'm sorry, 19-teens, um, he came back to Toledo after it seemed like his entertainment career had fizzled out. He got a job at Electric Autolite. He and his wife, Catherine, gave birth to a son, Don, and they rented an apartment in the Secor Mansion, which is located just across Bush Street from today's TPS headquarters. They live in that apartment, and after about a year, Joey gets a call um, and a chance to work in a Broadway variety show. They move out to New York. One thing led to another. Motion pictures become a thing and Joey Brown ends up in Hollywood, and he headlines some of the biggest comic movies of the 1920s and 30s. But in the middle of the 30s, Joey Brown risked it all. He took on a cause, that of Jewish refugees in Europe, in 1936, well before it was fashionable, greatly risking his Midwestern popularity. He testified in Congress on behalf of the Wagner-Rogers bill and put his family where his mouth is by adopting two Jewish refugee children himself. Just a few blocks away from the Browns was this young man, one of my favorites, Carl Joseph. Uh, Carl Joseph grew up uh, in the North End, son of Syrian immigrants. Um, Carl, Carl got kicked out of Woodward, and Waite took him on as what we would call an out-of-district today. Um, after graduation from here by the skin of his teeth, he's kind of in and out of trouble. He's a union organizer in the 30s, um, and he was convicted, erroneously it later turned out, in a pipe bombing incident during one strike. The one person willing to stick up for this guy when he was trying to get into the University of Toledo was his Waite High School English teacher, Tom Hall. And in this letter, she wrote, I'm not gonna read the whole letter, I promise, but there's some really good stuff in here. Um, this was a letter to the Dean of Students at UT, uh, Dr. Carter. Uh, Dr. Carter, as I found out in my research, uh, tends to be a common enemy of a lot of people in Toledo, Ohio at this time. And there are lots of letters defending people to Dr. Carter. Um, but Mrs. Hall writes this amazing letter. And I, I, can, I can post these slides online for you guys if you want to see the whole thing later, uh, or you can get the book. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great letter um, where she talks about this kid and his background. And I'm going to skip down a couple paragraphs. Um, and she says, he came to me in a freshman English class 
where he uh, proved at once that he possessed a good mind. Very shortly, however, he refused to do what I asked him to do. Imagine that, teachers. Um, then I had a long talk with him to discover why he was so defiant. The result of our heart-to-heart -heart talk was the unburdened his mind to me, telling me of his difficulty with his parents, who were still old world in their ideas and ideals. He explained that a wide gap existed between them and him, for they were still living in Syria in thoughts and actions, while he was American in every respect. From that time on, I had a better understanding of the boy, and we had no further difficulty. He was, and I presume is, still a lad of strong convictions, a believer in social justice and fair play, and a doggedly stubborn individual in his views. In spite of his connections with various strikes in Toledo and his term in jail, I do not believe he is malicious, communistic, or evil. And the letter goes on, and I just think it's this beautiful statement by this woman who sticking up for her kid no matter what. Um, each of these people were sharpened by their depression ex era experiences to become the best versions of themselves. Similar events and traumas, however, led other Toledos in different directions. And it started in 1937 with a group called the Young Nationalists, who supported a form of American government based on fascism. Using stolen explosives, which some theorized were stolen from the National Guard during the Autolite strike, uh, the Young Nationalists unleashed a brief wave of terror across the city, uh, detonating bombs at Robinson School on the same day as a board meeting, on the front step of the Board of Education President's house, and the site of a WPA project up in Washington Township. There were other Toledoans who were even more overt in their support of the Hitler regime. We had a local German language newspaper that published verbatim propaganda from Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels. And Father Charles Coughlin, who uh, presented a radio program out of Detroit, had an enormous following down in Toledo. And by 1941, Toledo had an active chapter of the America First Committee, many of whom were simply against uh, entry into the war, but who also brought some violently anti-Semitic speakers into the city. When Pearl Harbor happened, though, a lot of these disagreements disappeared, at least on the surface. And Toledoans flung themselves headlong into the war effort for reasons that were more often far more complex than pure patriotism. Uh, Bill Provancha volunteered for the Army Air Corps hours after his mailman gave him the notice, your draft card's coming. So he ran and volunteered for the Air Force, believing that flying would be safer and involve less walking than the Army. George Lambroff, our football player, was drafted into the infantry. And after training, he was assigned to the 15th Regiment, 3rd Infantry Division. On his arrival to the notice, I'm, I'm sorry, on his arrival to the unit, he met the platoon staff sergeant, a young Texan by the name of Audie Murphy, who nicknamed Lambroff Jojo. Lou Diamond was pretty old for a World War recruit when he volunteered for the Marines at 27 in 1917 for the First World War. Diamond made a career out of the Marines, serving in the Marine Battalion in Shanghai that was left there throughout the 20s and 30s. And in December of 41, he came back to Toledo for the first time in decades. He was here for three days. And at age 51, heard the news of Pearl Harbor, packed his sea bag, and headed for the train station again. Diamond made his way out to the coast, badgered his way into a combat unit, and officers told him again and again, you are not fit for war at your age. Lou Diamond was not taking that for a second. Dr. William Needrew Thomas joined the Navy in 43. He, there is, a, hosted through the Toledo Library, there's a really great audio archive of a, a three-hour interview with Dr. Thomas that if you're interested in black history in Toledo, this is an absolute necessity. And he talks about his really complex feelings joining the military in 43. And it was in no way a patriotic decision or an unpatriotic decision when he went into the Navy. It was a decision of, this presents the least danger at this point in my life where I'm at. And he volunteered for the service. Now, there is absolutely no doubt that if Dr. Thomas had been white, he would have gotten an officer's commission in 15 seconds. But this man who had cum laude degrees, a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD, was accepted as a seaman recruit by the United States Navy. Um, he was sent to Camp Robert Smalls, a segregated black-only portion of Naval Tra Training Station Great Lakes, um, where they quickly found out 
he could do a lot more than move things around. And Dr. Thomas ended up helping develop the first aptitude tests that the Navy ever used. And the research they created was used in creating the SAT after the war. Mary Frances Goldman of the Old West End knew plenty about tests. Uh, a Scott graduate and school teacher in Michigan, Goldman was one of the first two Toledo women to volunteer for the Women's Army Corps. With her training as a teacher and her bachelor's degree, Goldman, unlike Thomas, was minted as an officer quickly. Um, the other of the first two women in Toledo to join the service was uh, Margaret Chick, who I don't have a picture of right now. Um, a unpleasant work environment at the firm that she worked at in Toledo uh, led her to believe the Army was the better of her options during the war. Both of these Toledo women found themselves quickly at the center of events. One of Mary Frances's acquaintances from Collingwood Temple was Steve Mossbacher, son of the family that escaped Nazi Germany uh, just before Kristallnacht. Steve's story is pretty fascinating. Um, in 1943, he goes to basic, and they realize quickly that he's smarter than the average recruit. He applies to a program called ASTP that was to get uh, enlisted men into a college program and, and turn them into officers. He gets sent to the University of Missouri for this officer program, and he's thrilled because he's going to get college paid for, and they're going to pay him O1 salary instead of E1, and, and this is a lot better thing. But while he's out in Missouri, a couple of officers come in, and they pull him out of class for a language test. And they start asking him a lot of questions about his family background, experiences. Where in Germany did you live? What accents can you do? He was being recruited for a counterintelligence program being organized at Camp Ritchie, Maryland. They offer Steve a promotion to sergeant, not to lieutenant, but they promise him you're going to have a lot cooler job than infantry. Since ASTP was about to get shut down, it was the good move. Steve takes the offer and gets to Ritchie, where he finds thousands of other young European Jewish men just like himself, young men whose families had uh, escaped Nazi occupation of Germany, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and were being turned into a powerful counterintelligence team. Specifically, the primary job they would have would be interrogating prisoners of war. Steve's career, pardon the indelicacy here, was something a career of uh, a mix of James Bond and Inglorious Bastards, for those who know. Joey Brown's path to service was tragic in its own way. Uh, in 1942, his Toledo-born son, Don, was killed in an aircraft training accident in California. 51-year-old Joey was too old to join the military, but he wasn't too old to serve the people. Joey Brown approached the USO before Don's death, but they were moving too slowly. So Joey Brown chartered his own plane, hired his own pilot, and got himself flown illegally into war zones to entertain kids. Before Don Brown died, Joey had planned on going legit through the USO program. When they didn't move quick enough, he said, I was going to meet my son in the Pacific to entertain him one way. I'm going to meet other kids over there some other way. He said, I would keep my rendezvous not with my son, but with hundreds of thousands of Dons, other people's Dons. And Joe Brown spent the rest of the war making other people's kids laugh and trying to get even with the Empire of Japan in the missions that his son never got, got to fly. Now, as the war began, Toledo's industry readied for war, too. And this is a part that I'm really going to cut short tonight, but I have lots of really cool industry stuff in the book, I promise. Let's, let's talk about our highlight, uh, the Jeep. So, of course, our signature contribution was the Jeep, and that story's been told well and better before. What I would like to talk about tonight is the invisible hand behind the Jeep. Um, the contract for the scout car here is almost impossible for us to believe in, in today's uh, workflow. The Army gave them 75 days. They sent out a request for proposal and said, uh, in 75 days, we don't need drawings. We need the vehicle. Um, so this thing went soup to nuts in 75 days from design to prototype. Only one company made the deadline, and it wasn't us. It was a company called American Bantam out of Butler, PA. This is their prototype the day they rolled it out. And you notice it looks suspiciously like a Toledo-built Jeep. Um, Bantam's biggest problem, though, was capacity. They could not in any way hit the Army's target of building 75 of these a day. So the government just gives Bantam's blueprints 
to Ford Motor Company and Willis Overland to modify how they saw fit in what was basically a second round of competition. And for a while, it very much looked like Bantam's brainchild was going to be Ford's golden goose. Um, and that's where the most important Toledo and a lot of people have never heard of comes in. John David Biggers was the president of Libby Owens Ford. He was not a Jeep guy. He was not a Willis guy. Um, but he was the most prominent Toledoan in the FDR administration. Biggers had gotten quite a reputation during the Depression as a captain of industry. Roosevelt brought him in on a New Deal program. And when the war broke out, Roosevelt brought Biggers back to, Toledo, back, sorry, back to Washington uh, to coordinate things in the office of production management. Um, when Biggers gets ready to start this job with OPM, he came home to Toledo while it was still legal. And he came home before he's a government official by hours. And he got city leaders from city government and city industry together. He gets them in one room and he says, get moving. We need inventories. You inventory supplies, tools, exact measures of square footage among all your facility, and most critically, inventories of people. How many tool and die makers do you have? How many guys with a journeyman card? How many pipe fitters? How many glass cutters? Every company in Toledo was inventorying the living snot out of everything they had. So when the government would issue an RFP and say, hey, we need somebody who can do this, Companies in Toledo, before a company from Gary, Indiana or wherever, could say, yep, we've got, the, we've got the people, we've got the tools, we've got the square footage. So when it comes time to assigning government contracts, Toledo ends up earning a disproportionate share from this early preparation. And no company benefited more from Bigger's intervention than Willis Overland. Um, Bigger spoke with Willis President Ward Kennedy, who happened to be his neighbor, um, and urged him to drop the price of his vehicle to undercut Ford. That still wasn't enough. So Biggers went over his head to the chief of OPM and said, look, can Ford build the scout car? Sure, they can do it. But Ford can also make deuce and a half trucks and bombers and trailers. How about we make sure this company that can do the scout car gets the scout cars and the mighty Ford Motor Company can get literally everything else plus some of the scout cars. Um, Willis gets the majority of the contract, and the rest, of course, is history for our city to this day. The Jeep itself became a cultural icon among soldiers and the general public almost immediately, and Willis knew they had a post-war gold mine on their hands. Try to imagine a military contractor taking out full-page ads in the paper to advertise something that nobody can buy three years before the war is over. And that's what Willis Overland was doing. They were running monthly ads for the Jeep, a vehicle that nobody could buy, knowing that they were stoking demand for the post-war era. Um, the matter eventually went to a protracted court battle between Bantam and Willis, um, and Willis kind of earned it on a technical knockout by outlasting Bantam, which went out of business in 56. Bringing it back to the actual combat. Toledoans fought or witnessed fighting in nearly every notable battle in which the United States was engaged. Some of those stories are really well told. Um, there are great Blade articles uh, on the anniversaries of Pearl Harbor where you can learn everything you want to learn about Toledoans who fought at Pearl Harbor. I'd like to go into some of the a little bit more obscure stories that tie into our friends that we've already met. Um, the same day as Pearl Harbor, of course, uh, you had attacks all across the Pacific, uh, most notably in the Philippines. And um, these two men here are two really interesting story, Toledo stories out of the Philippines. Um, Father John Duffy on the left was a diocesan priest here and served at Immaculate Conception in St. Anne's parishes here. Uh, at age 41, he joined the Army Chaplain Corps in 1940 and was sent to Clark Air Base in the Philippines. Father Duffy retreated with the rest of Americans at Clark uh, to the Bataan Peninsula and turned 42 during that time. Father Duffy at that age, in his condition, struggled to keep up during what we all know as the Bataan Death March today. And on April 15th, he was bayoneted and left for dead until other soldiers helped him to his feet to march on. Seven days later, he straggled again and was bayoneted again and left for dead. He was the younger of these two men. Even older than him was the grandly named Arlington Ulysses Betts, uh, a native of the eponymous Bettsville down in Seneca County. 
Uh, Mr. Betts came to Toledo in the 1880s and established a rubber company near the foot of Jefferson Avenue at the river. And he was kind of an up-and-comer in Toledo's society set of the 1880s until the Spanish-American War broke out. And in 1898, at age 31, uh, Betts was commissioned an officer and set, sent with American forces to the Philippines. After the war, his fellow Ohioan, William Howard Taft, named him a military governor of one of the provinces. And Betts came to realize that the Philippines were rich in resources. Um, so after his governorship, Betts took advantage of his imperialist connections, uh, opened a lumber bill and an exports business, and never came back to Toledo. Fast forward to 1941, and Douglas MacArthur arrives in the Philippines. Um, the now 74-year-old Betts is seen as Macar by MacArthur uh, as, well, that's the guy I want to put back in political office, and puts Betts kind of in the Japanese crosshairs as now a U.S. imperialist official again. Um, Betts makes his way onto an assassination list for the Japanese military, who begin hunting for these American colonial officials throughout the islands. Incredibly, both of them survived. More incredibly, both of them became guerrilla leaders in the mountains. Um, Betts and his family in their 70s uh, disappeared into the hills, survived off the land, and hid rebel groups uh, in Albay province. Father Duffy faced a much harder path. Father Duffy's roommate for a while in the Philippines was General Jonathan Wainwright, who uh, was one of the top American commanders left behind famously uh, by MacArthur. Duffy, during his time as Wainwright's roommate, learned quite a bit about strategy and tactics. And this Catholic priest from Toledo ends up being the military advisor to this group of Filipino rebels. Um, they get captured about a year after Bataan. And once he's recaptured, Father Duffy is sent to a series of prison camps in the Philippines um, before the Japanese decide to put him on what was called a hell ship. And if you've never heard of these, um, during the Second World War, the Japanese would fill up every 10th random cargo ship with a thousand American prisoners and basically dare the American submarines, sure, you can go cargo raiding on our cargo ships, uh, but you got a one in 10 chance of killing a thousand of your own guys. Um, Father Duffy survived one attack on a hell ship, which is pretty much unheard of. He was placed on another, uh, and at the end of the war, he was a prisoner of war in Manchuria uh, when the continent was liberated. Now, uh, Duffy and Betts were not the only borderline senior citizens from Toledo in the Pacific. Um, younger Marines swore that Lou Diamond uh, joined the Marine Corps at Tun Tavern in 1775. And the legend was that he was a 200-year-old Marine. Now, the 200-year-old Marine had bullied his superiors into deploying him. And they thought, that's good enough. We'll just get him over there and he'll be happy. No. Um, Diamond ends up fighting uh, and commanding a mortar squad in 5th Marines uh, on Tulagi and Guadalcanal. And there the legend of Lou Diamond only grew as his 81 millimeter mortar crew plopped a shell immediately on the deck of a Japanese ship that was passing. That ship left, whether it was because of the mortar fire or not is another story entirely, um, but the old man got the reputation as the guy who can shoot ships out of the water. Um, he fought through some of the toughest fighting on Guadalcanal uh, at Edson's Ridge, eight weeks later at the Matanacau, where he was so ill that his battery mates fashioned a wheelbarrow to move him from position to position to sight the mortars. He was evacuated to New Zealand with two broken ribs, kidney failure, malaria, and rheumatism, uh, and a few months later went AWOL from that hospital in New Zealand and hitchhiked his way 3,000 miles over open ocean to the north coast of Australia, where he rejoined his unit with a sloppy salute. The next month, the Commandant of the entire Marine Corps flew to Australia, presented him with a semi-made-up medal naming him the Ideal Marine, and put his butt on a plane to get him home. You're not going over there anymore. Now, this was not in the script, but I have to tell you. Uh, April of 1950, I'm sorry, June of 1950, the Korean War breaks out, and at age 80, he shows up at the uh, recruiter's office. They're like, sorry, Gunny. Time to go home. Uh, in a continuing theme of men too old to be close to the front was Joey Brown. Brown made good on his promise to his son and traveled more miles than any other American entertainer over the course of the war, getting far closer to the front than any other entertainer, including the far more celebrated Bob Hope. Joey took enemy fire in New Guinea, Burma, Italy, and North Africa. 
Every time he had the opportunity, he begged senior officers to let him fly on a bombing mission to carry out the job his son never got to do. And by the end of the war, Joey Brown had flown on seven opposed active bombing missions over enemy territory, enough to qualify him as a civilian for the Air Medal. Joey came back to Toledo in the middle of the war at an inopportune time, October 1944. Came back for his mom's birthday party up on Joffrey on the west side. Um, while he was here, he got word that MacArthur's men had liberated the Philippines and that he could come entertain the troops back in the islands. Joey cut his trip short, flew overseas, and met up with, of all units, the 148th Regiment, Toledo's own National Guard formation. At some point while he was doing shows with these guys, that division's commanding general, Robert Beitler, asked Brown if he'd, help, if he'd like to help liberate the city of Bambang. The actor enthusiastically accepted the officer, uh, offer, Beitler said, and he embedded Brown around June 6th as they pushed north into this town. Joe Brown was placed in the lead tank, and they drove into an ambush. Beitler said, Joe was worrying the life out of me because I felt personally responsible for his safety. He had more personal courage than any entertainer I ever met. When the tank took fire, Brown's regiment's commander emerged from the tank wielding a carbine, and so did Joe. They took aim at Japanese soldiers who fired at the column. One went down at 75 yards and another at 100, Brown said. The boys said I got them and they gave me a Japanese flag that they were carrying. And at long last, for good or ill, haunted the rest of his life, Joey Brown delivered the blows that my Don had never managed. Bill Provencia got his wish. He didn't have to walk anywhere, at least until the very end. Instead, he got to swim to shore. Uh, the first plane that he took to Europe crashed at sea right off the coast of Prestwick, Scotland, and the crew survived and swam to shore. His second plane was shot out of the sky, and he earned a distinguished flying cross uh, after the second Schweinfurt raid. It was the third plane that went under him that made him walk. Um, and he was taken prisoner of, of war by the Germans, and we'll, we'll come back to him in a little bit. George Lambroff, Jojo, uh, fought through Sicily, Italy, and France with his friend Audie Murphy. When their 15th Regiment made it into Germany in spring of 1945, they came across something none of them were prepared for, one of the out camps of Dachau. For George, who was born Jewish, reaching the camps was a gut-wrenching gut emotional experience. And it was the moment that called back the discipline that he learned on the football field right here from Jack Mollenkoff and Frank Pauli. It's a quote from Mr. Lambroff. We saw three gigantic holes. I don't know how they dug these holes. They were square, corners and everything. And we saw bodies, row after row, in one of them. I was still Jewish at the time, and I had another kid who was Jewish from Wisconsin. He lost it. Oh, man. I caught him slamming his rifle butt into this German guard, shattered his jaw and his eye socket. He said to me, you're Jewish. Why didn't you do that? I didn't want to be like them. The boy who had once spiked an opponent's hand on the field out of a fit of anger had become a man who could control it. He told that Wisconsin boy, quote, maybe someday you might thank me. He said, I don't think so. And I don't know if he did or not. Jake Chandler was promoted to first lieutenant and led a platoon of the 370th Infantry Regiment in Italy. Throughout the winter of 44 and 45, Chandler and his men existed in a world of misery and mud, with progress measured in feet and inches on a good day. Account after account from his unit made the Italian campaign that winter seem like probably the most miserable place in the entirety of the war. Margaret Chick at center with her slightly famous boss over to the left um, was one of the first two Toledo women to join the Women's Army Corps. Um, her friend Mary Frances Goldman worked in a few administrative jobs in England after deploying and was eventually assigned to the Army Historian's Office. In this job, Lieutenant Goldman collected records from field units and flew them back to England where they were organized for the official unit histories that would be written after the war and are an invaluable resource to us today. Um, when uh, D-Day broke out when the, when the D-Day invasion happened, uh, Mary Frances Goldman, I'm sorry, 
I got my slides messed up. Um, Mary Frances Goldman got transferred over to Paris with the Quartermaster's Corps to help supply the men who were going to the front, which became especially important in December of 44 as we're going towards the Battle of the Bulge. Um, one December night, she's passing out boots, and who comes by but her friend from Collingwood Temple, Steve Mossbacher. The friends exchanged words, and then Mossbacher was gone, off to the front. And as that battle was beginning that night, Margaret Chick was 15 miles across Paris with a ringside seat to the drama. She had been on Ike's secretarial staff since North Africa, followed him to London, and then followed him to a pretty decent public housing project called Versailles. Um, on the night the Battle of the Bulge began, Margaret Chick was the maid of honor for another one of Eisenhower's secretaries who was getting married in the Marie Antoinette Chapel at Versailles. That wedding, by the way, um, Ike was the guest of honor. It was the first wedding of commoners ever in the Marie Antoinette Chapel, the first wedding of Americans, and the last wedding of any kind held in the Marie Antoinette Chapel. Uh, I don't know if that is a reflection on the couple or not. Um, during the wedding reception held out in the Versailles Palace, uh, Eisenhower and the other brass just started disappearing. It was the night of December 16th when the Battle of the Bulge uh, was fully engaged beginning at the end of the European War. Um, all of these people, along with their hometown, were transformed by this war. Um, existing industries frantically expanded. New businesses cropped up around the city to take on government contracts. Willis Overland uh, had a hit on its hands with a civilian Jeep, and the factory barely missed a shift in production uh, when they switched over from military to civilian. It was one week that the factory went from we're building only military things to we're building only civilian things. Transformed at the same time were race relations in Toledo. As servicemen made their way home to an overcrowded city with very little housing stock, the city made a conscious decision to offer brand new housing on the edges of the city that was only open to white people in suburban areas of the city. It freed up less desirable housing in the city's white ethnic neighborhoods for black Toledoans. This was a decision with profound consequences over the decades, accelerating white flight and leading to overcrowded, underinvested new communities, uh, underinvested new communities in neighborhoods adjacent to downtown. Another driver of change in the post-war world was the brainchild of the then brand new publisher that's Toledo Blade, Paul Block Jr. Uh, in March of 1944, Block contracted with Broadway set designer Norman Bel Geddes to create what the paper called a, I have to say this in 30s radio announcer voice, right? Scientifically conceived master plan, uh, anchored by a giant model, imagining what Toledo would look like in the far advanced year of 1995. The Toledo that Norman Bel Geddes imagined was beyond imagination. And the centerpiece was our train station, where the train station is today but it was also gonna double as our passenger airport. Um, as many of you know, uh, Toledo's pre-war airport was over by Lake High School, Metcalf Field. Um, and the city had been arguing since the 1930s about where closer to downtown we could add passenger service. Bel Geddes believed, let's just get rid of the old South End. And they're like, what part? And he's like, no, the entire old South End. Um, what you're looking at there in the top left corner you're looking at the Anthony Wayne Bridge going across, and basically this was everything between the trail and the river, the Facet Street Bridge and the Anthony Wayne's Bridge, gone. Um, you can't exactly see it here, but they really believed back then that seaplanes were going to be a bigger part of our lives than they are, and there was going to be a seaplane anchorage, a cruise ship terminal, the train station, the passenger air terminal, uh, all there. And that wasn't the only one. There would be five airports around the city, um, connected by high-speed, congestion-proof express highways. Now, the dreaming on this was cool, but my favorite thing I learned about Toledo tomorrow came from a Toledo firefighter that the Blade interviewed uh, the night that it opened. Um, Toledo firefighter Alfred Stewart had migrated to Toledo and didn't visit it right away. He comes in a couple nights later. Um, as the patriarch of an African-American family, quote, we always had been on the outside looking in. As Negroes, there was little we could say until fellow white citizens had passed judgment, the Blade reported. Looking in on the model from the observation platform, Stuart mused on the larger picture. 
Are we whites and Negroes ready for a Toledo tomorrow? Are we emotionally mature to accept the great responsibility of such a wonderful city? We have always been tolerated. We've always been on the outside looking in, just like I'm doing right now. Will this be a real tomorrow or will it merely be an ultra today? Will this be a city of the future? Not unless we realize a city cannot go any higher than its lowest bracketed people. Almost prophetically, Firefighter Stewart continued, it's ironic that man can create a wonder such as this and then nullify physical progress because hearts aren't in the right place. As much as the city was transformed, more were the lives of those who participated in the war. Uh, Mary Frances Goldman came home to the city and became a civic pillar, volunteering in TPS, reading to our kids, uh, volunteering with the zoo, and a score of other organizations. Uh, Margaret Chick married another general's age, Ed Donnan, and lived near the Pentagon for a spell before they moved to St. Louis. Toledo was never her home again. Carl Joseph, the union organizer, who was wholly American in every way while his parents were stuck in the old world, Carl became a paratrooper and jumped twice in Italy, where he bought rare books and sent them back to the University of Toledo President Philip Nash, with whom he maintained a rich and amazing correspondence throughout the war. Carl helped build UT's rare books collection, both while he was in Italy and while he was in England. On June 6, 1944, Carl jumped into Normandy with the 82nd Airborne, just outside St. Mariglis. He was killed in action the next day uh, in the fight for the high ground on the Cotentin Peninsula, so many miles from his parents' Syria and so many miles from his own America. Today, the Carl Joseph Collection Reading Commons at UT is named after him by his loving siblings. Bill Provencia escaped that German prisoner of war camp at the end of the war. Uh, over several days, he and a few comrades slowly poked their way through German territory to reach American lines. He went back to work in the automotive industry after the war and became a pillar in his family, his church, and this community. Just a couple of years ago, the French Consul General came out to Point Place and presented him with the French Legion of Honor. Jojo Lambroth made it back to our rundown train station one night in 1946 and didn't want to wait for a cab. He slung his bag over his shoulder, walked all the way across the high-level bridge to his mom's house near Good Shepherd Parish. He reached in his pocket and pulled out his house key, which he somehow never lost in deployments on three continents and countless battles. He let himself in and snuck upstairs and snuck upstairs to surprise his mom and sisters. Sorry. Uh, a week before he died, uh, Mr. Lambroff told me he'd never been that hard in his life. Uh, Joey Brown made it home too. Uh, one night in 1946, after a production in Chicago, General Beitler of the 37th Division back in the Philippines walked up to the stage as the audience clapped for the cast at the end of the show. There on stage, General Beitler presented Joey Brown with the Bronze Star Medal, one of only two civilians so honored with the fourth highest award for valor in the entirety of World War II. Joey's career, however, was essentially over. Quote, I'm not the comedian I once was, Brown said a few years after the war. A comedian has to be slightly insulting. Comedy has to be 70% insults. It has to be mean. And I'm afraid today when I say something funny, it might hurt somebody. I've lost something there, but I'm not sorry. I know I've become too sensitive. He, of course, had one great role left. His showstopper at the end of Some Like It Hot. Nobody's perfect. Jake Chandler's story ended on a riverbank in Italy in February of 1945. As American lines broke under a German offensive, Chandler's platoon alone held under the attack in which he was killed. He was posthumously awarded the Silver Star Medal, an award that almost certainly would have been a Distinguished Service Cross had he been white. Dr. William N. Thomas made it home before the end of the war. A superior officer in Chicago said, listen, I need somebody to take a boring job demobilizing sailors in this crappy town a couple hours from here. Are you willing to go to Toledo? 
<laughs> Thomas said he had to keep himself from smiling to show how excited he was when he accepted the position. He came home to Toledo and served at the Naval Armory at Bayview Park, helping get men discharged from the Navy. After leaving the service, Thomas added a Juris Doctorate on for good measure with the BA, MA, and PhD, and established a thriving legal pro, uh, practice in the city. And in 1967, Dr. Thomas was elected president of the Toledo Board of Education, the same board that would not hire him in 1935 on account of his race. One last story to wrap up is that of Steve Mossbacher, the German Jewish refugee who came to Toledo and was selected to be a counterintelligence operative. After the Battle of the Bulge, Mossbacher's team interviewed scores of German prisoners of war, getting a good idea of the disposition of German forces at the Bulge. When the Bulge collapsed, Mossbacher is on the first bolus of troops going through into German territory, and he goes through on exactly the road that his family escaped from Germany from, the road from Aachen to Maastricht. He was billeted with the Dutch family in the town of Margraten and went off to interrogate prisoners during the war and then come home to the Vronin family's house at night. The family became lifelong friends with Mossbacher and his family. In March of 45, Mossbacher's team left Margraten and headed into Germany. The number of letters he sent home went down as the pace of operations went up. And on the night of April 2nd, Steve Mossbacher found the one situation he couldn't escape. On a mission to find billeting for the night, Mossbacher and his CO drove their Toledo-built Jeep into a trap near Cologne, Germany. Under fire, they retreated and found another of a group of Americans under threat nearby. Quotes from his CO, Captain Elting. Sergeant Mossbacher was laughing as he went. I could hear his laughter above all the shooting and shouting. I have a split second memory of how the running soldier's face lit up with happiness as Stephen caught his hand, saved him, and pulled him into the Jeep. I shall always remember this of him, that he spurned safety to fight beside me in the most desperate moment of life, that he was not afraid that he died trying to save others, and they died laughing in death's very face. Few men who lived out a full smug lifetime in comfort and safety did as much. It was 37 days before the war was over. Steve is buried to this day in Margraten, the town in which he stayed with the Vronins. And to this day, a third generation of the Vronin family decorates Steve Mossbacher's grave. In many ways, our European friends remember our ancestors' sacrifices in a more profound and real way than we do. And if there's one thing I hope you got out of this night, it's perhaps to share in their reverence, not necessarily for the battlefield casualties and the overt acts of bravery, but for the bravery inherent in each of these people well before they left Toledo, Ohio. Poor kids from the wrong side of town, immigrant kids who were discriminated against by adults, Targets of sexual, racial, and religious bigotry. Old people who could have sat this one out and chose not to. To me, these were all people who were heroes well before they got swept up into world events. Thank you so much for your time tonight. And I know I ran really late, so I'm gonna give it back to Robin for a preview of our next speaker. Thank you. Joe, we want to thank you for sharing your passion, your love of history, and the love of these men and women with us tonight. So thank you very much. It is appreciated. Um, as he's indicated on the last slide here, please join us again in May. It will be at Bowser High School, May 12th at 7 p.m., and it will feature the cemeteries of Forest, Woodlawn, and Calvary. We do have a fall series lineup of guest speakers for local history, so check our TPS homepage or check our Facebook page. That will be announced in May, but please Please come May 12th if you can. Again, thank you, Joe, very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for organizing this. My wife will kill me if I don't put the uh, QR code back up there.